morning, church. God is awesome. He's amazing, and he loves you so much. And I love telling you that every week because it's the truth. And now, listen, we taught you a song last week that was called Sing, 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 and it talks about making music with the heavens and, and rejoicing unto God. And so can we sing that again today and, and lift our hearts towards our Lord and Savior? Amen. Let's do that. Maybe if you're sitting down somewhere, maybe you want to stand up and clap your hands, and, and we're going to you know have some movement here and have some excitement because, you know, it's okay to have fun when you worship the Lord. Amen? So let's sing this together. Sing, sing. Maybe, maybe some of you might think, I don't really feel like I have something to praise him for. But I'm telling you, you do. He's the one that even gives us the, the breath that we have in our lungs. He's the one that, that has given us the, the, the life that we have. The Bible says that, that everything 
is, is sustained by him. Even our, you know, I admit, I don't always know exactly how that works scientifically speaking, but all the, all the molecules and cells in our body, if it weren't for God, they would not be even be sustained. So we have so many reasons to be grateful and thankful to our Lord and Savior. And, and I'm telling you, you're going to have many, many more as you put your trust in him and your hope in him. But let's continue in our time of worship and thank the Lord for what he's done in our lives. Thank you, Lord. And if I got us for us, then who could ever stop us? And if 
Lord, truly, if God be for us, then who can be against us? Lord, as much, as, as much turmoil and chaos as we see in this world right now, Lord, we do not have to be afraid because you truly are for us and you are with us. And Lord, you have called us to be lights in this world of darkness. So Lord, we are at an, at an advantage in the midst of dark, dark times and dark situations because we carry the light of Christ in us. So we don't need to be afraid. We don't need to cower in fear. We don't have to, to wonder what's going to happen because we know what's going to happen because you have written the end of the book. Because you have already spoken that you will come down and reign. So the only question, the question is not whether or not you are, you're going to come and, and reign on this earth. The question is who's going to be a part of your kingdom. And we know that your desire is for everyone to come to the knowledge of repentance, is for everyone to come to you. You're, it's not your will that any should perish. So we thank you, Lord, that we do not have to be afraid of darkness, even when we see it right in front of our faces. But instead, Lord, we should have confidence that we are able to bring in the light of Christ in the midst of that darkness and, and dispel it, remove it. If anything, Lord, the darkness should be afraid of us. Not because of us, not because of us, you know, who we are on our own, but because of Christ in us. And Lord, I really believe that's the situation, that the devil is terrified right now, that the children of God are going to awaken and rise up and realize who they are in Christ and actually boldly face this darkness that we see. And, and where as the world would want us to face it, you know, to fight evil with evil. No, 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 we overcome evil with good. That's who we are. That's how you made us. And I thank you, Lord, that you will cause us to do that. And I know the devil is so scared of that. And he will try to lie and he will try to deceive us to make us think that we are in a defeated position. But that is not the truth. We are more than overcomers, more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are victorious in Christ. We have the victory in him. So Lord, I rebuke all those lies the devil would try to bring out, which really there, there's nowhere to bring them out from because they're not true, but that he would try to tell us that, oh no, something, you know, the world is just going to come to an end and everything's going to be so bad and there's going to be no hope. No, 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 Lord, that's not the truth. Even the name of our church is called Living Hope. Hope has not died because Christ is risen. Our hope is alive forever and eternal. So we thank you, Lord, that we not only have hope for our own personal lives individually, but then we can bring that hope that we have to others who don't know it. Lord, there are many who are walking in darkness in this world, and they don't even realize it. But Lord, let us be children of the light who go forth in the midst of that darkness and shine brightly and then bring people who were, who were otherwise walking in the darkness and bring them into the light, into the family of God, into the kingdom of God. And Lord, help us to actively be participators in what you're doing in this world right now. Because Lord, you even told us to pray. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And maybe sometimes we think, well, if God wants it to happen, then it's just gonna happen. You know, we don't even need to pray. But that's not what you said. You said to actually actively pray that your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven, which means that there are times when there's your will in heaven and it's not being done on earth. So Lord, let us be prayer warriors who would, who would get on our knees or, or, or go into our closets or whatever we need to do and would pray against the darkness that we see and pray for the people that we know need to know Jesus and even preach Jesus to them. That we would pray, Lord, that your will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And what is your will? Your will is, is that no one would perish, but that all would come to repentance. You take no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. So Lord, let us not either. Let us have that same love in our hearts that you have for people, even people who are the worst among us. Because Christ died for them too. Christ died for the people we hate the most. And I thank you, Lord. I thank you that he did. Because if it weren't for that, I nor anybody else on this stage or anybody else who believes in Jesus would have any hope. But because you did that, because you sent your son Jesus to die for us, 
to conquer sin and death. We don't have to fear those things anymore. And really, no one in this world has to either, but they need to believe it. They need to receive it. And how are they going to believe it unless we tell them about it? So Lord, let us be bold proclaimers of your gospel. And let us be bright lights shining in the midst of this dark world. We love you and we praise you for all that you've done in our lives, Lord. We praise you for all that you're, you're currently doing. And by faith, Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do in the future because you said your plans are to prosper us, not to harm us, to give us a future and a hope. So we thank you for all these things and we pray them in the mighty name of your son, Jesus. And everyone together said, amen. Amen, amen. amen. Yeah. I'm telling you, there, there are a lot of people who are afraid, a lot of people who are nervous, even Christians who are so nervous about what the future holds. But I want to declare over you, that will not, and, and myself as well, that will not be us. We are not going to be like that. We are going to be excited for what God's going to do. We are going to come against the forces of darkness with all the light that's in us, which is really the light of Christ himself. I don't know how it works. How can God, who's infinite, dwell inside of us who are, who are finite, right? But that's how it is. And what that means is the power of God is on the inside of us to tear down these, these walls that the enemy has, has brought, brought up and, and, to, and to combat the forces of darkness and to come against all the schemes of the enemy. We've been given so much and we don't even realize it sometimes. So I pray that, that the Lord uh, encourage you and lift you up and cause you to realize who you are in Christ. Because I'm telling you, you are stronger and more powerful than you realize. Not in and of yourself, but by the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells within you. So anyways, before I preach a message of my own, um, prepare your heart to receive uh, a word from our, our pastor, uh, Bill Wilcox. And I'm telling you, I want you really to open your heart and to receive what, what the, the, the Lord is speaking to you. Because yes, it might be Pastor Bill um, giving the words, you know, they're coming out of his mouth physically, but it's from the Lord. The Lord will speak to you if you're willing to listen. And so I pray that, that you have ears to hear and you would hear what the Lord is speaking to you. So be blessed by this message from our pastor. God bless you all. Greetings, Living Hope Church family. God bless you. Welcome to our worship service for January the 17th, 2021. I'm joining you from the foyer of our, uh, of our worship center auditorium. I wanted to begin the sermon this morning a little bit different with, uh, with the announcements. That's how we usually do it. But then I have a video clip I want to show you. And then uh, you can go with me back into the... Uh, main part of the auditorium, and I'll do the, our message from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 uh, when we get back in there. So welcome. We're delighted that you've gathered with us today to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you so much to the worship team for their able leadership in, in taking us to a time of, of worship and praise and uh, singing to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And so uh, that is what we can do right now. We also meet up in the amphitheater on Sunday mornings at 1030. If you're able to join us, not for the faint of heart, but uh, it has been a wonderful time as we gather together. Yes, there have been some chilly mornings, uh, but it's always been a joy to be able to celebrate the Lord and to be together and to worship Him with one another. And so if you're in the area and able to make it, please join us at 1030 for our worship service up in the amphitheater. Uh, an announcement next Sunday, January the 24th, will be our annual congregational meeting and if you're a member of the church, it's very important that you be there. If you're not a member or you're curious, we welcome you to, to come also. Just know that you won't be able to vote. We have three items on which we are voting. Uh, one is the uh, moderator and vice moderator, something 
uh, a little bit new for us that we want to have an elected moderator for our congregational meetings, and then the vice moderator steps in in uh, in that moderator's absence if something were to happen. Uh, the second thing that we're voting on is our 2021 budget, and that is very important, brothers and sisters, because we commit ourselves to fund that budget and provide. These are the areas of ministry that the elders have identified that we want to move forward in. And so it is crucial that you know and be aware uh, of what we're doing with respect to the finances of this church. And so we invite you to uh, be part of that. So that is the second voting item. And the third voting item is voting on the elder board. We have two positions that are open on the board for 2021, and we have two candidates that are available to fill those two positions, but it is still important that uh, you as a member vote on those two candidates. One is Glenn Kippel, the other is George Rodriguez. So that's the annual congregational meeting coming up next Sunday after, immediately after the the worship service up in the amphitheater. Please do try to be there. Now, last of all, for this part of the service, I want to show you a little video clip. Tomorrow is Martin Luther King Day, and it is so important that we recognize the value of of his contribution to our country and the need uh, that we value everyone. Racism is wrong. It's sin. And so we have a common table, and we in the body of Christ ought to really reflect that. And so sit back, enjoy the video clip, and I will join you from inside the auditorium after it's over. Let justice roll on like a river. Let righteousness be like a mighty stream. May the dividing wall of injustice fall so we may all sit together at a common table. May the all-powerful word of God that never returns void accomplish his will of peace and equality so we may all sit together at a common table. May each one of us practice humility and remember God created all people the same. May we turn away from discord and hate so we may all sit together at a common table. May we stand hard against injustice, sow seeds of trust, service, and hope, and above all, love God and our neighbor so we may all sit together at a common table. Lord, may every valley be exalted and every hill and mountain be made low. May the uneven be made straight, the rough places made smooth so we may all sit together at a common table. Amen. A common table. Let us be the family of God. Well, I told you we would be back in the uh, worship center auditorium, and so here we are. Take your Bibles, if you would, please turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians, We will be in chapter 5. By the way, a good opportunity to mention the uh, structured notes that I make available to all that are interested. And uh, those I send out usually on the Friday before. And uh, if you have some interest in that but haven't been receiving them, drop me an email, send me an email, let me know your interest. And obviously with your email address, and I would be glad to put you on our sermon notes list. All right, my email address, the easy one, is pastorbill, one word, at efcyv.org. All right? Well, have you ever written a letter? I know this is kind of old school. We didn't used to have personal computers by which we could write letters. We either typed them or hand wrote them. And have you ever written a letter, written a note to someone, but you ran out of paper? Well, it, it's almost as if the Apostle Paul was, was writing away and he was telling this 
Thessalonian church these important truths. He just finished the uh, information about the, uh, the, the day of the Lord and prior to that, the uh, coming of the Lord for the rapture and so forth. And uh, in the last part of chapter five, he, he just begins a rapid fire uh, delivery of, of incredibly important, simple, but profound truths that each of themselves would be a worthy sermon topic. But he sort of packs them all in at the very end of his message to get their, uh, get their brain going. Uh, these are final instructions. And uh, I have divided this last part of the book into three parts uh, with these final instructions. The first part we'll look at this morning is verses 12 through 15. And uh, he is looking at conduct in our relationships with people. And we'll look at three different groups of people that he addresses in that, the second uh, part of the sermons or of the series looks at the conduct of our relationship with God. And the third is basically his final words of benediction, of promise, and of instruction. So, if you have your Bibles and you're turned there, I hope you are. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 15, I will be reading from the New American Standard 2020 edition of the Holy Scriptures. 1 Thessalonians 5.12, but we ask you, brothers and sisters, to recognize those who diligently labor among you and are in leadership over you in the Lord and give you instruction, and that you regard them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. We urge you, brothers and sisters, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek what is good for one another and for all people. Let's pray together. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we come into your presence this day with deep gratitude for another day that you didn't promise to us. But Lord, you have given us life that we might know you and that we might make you known to those around us. And so, Lord, we invite you to speak to us, to open the eyes of our hearts, to really see and hear and understand your message to us today. We thank you that you have given us the Bible, the word of God, your very word, Lord. And so we ask you to, to help us to hear it, to understand and to apply it to our lives. Lord, to that end, I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit as I, as I worship you in this action of using my gifts to, to bring honor to you, my gifts of teaching and pastor, that, Lord, your children would be blessed and encouraged in their faith in Jesus. And so fill me with your spirit, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, in these four verses, 12 through 15, Paul gives instruction on our conduct with three different groups of people, church leaders, fellow believers, and those who have treated us unjustly. So let's take a look. How should we conduct ourselves with church leaders? Verses 12 and 13. But we ask you, brothers and sisters, to recognize those who diligently labor among you and are in leadership over you in the Lord and give you instruction. Who is he talking about here? Well, 
those who labor, which is the idea of working hard, uh, that they are in leadership over you, that is in the church, in the body of Christ. They, they give direction and vision and wisdom and that they give you instruction, teaching, how to live, what not to do, what to do, that kind of information. A young church uh, was this Thessalonian church, and uh, uh, their organization was, in all likelihood, very, very simple. In fact, nowhere in 1 Thessalonians or 2 Thessalonians are the terms pastor, elder, or deacon even mentioned. And so it was no doubt a very simple structure with, uh, with leaders amongst them. Uh, he defines them as those who diligently labor, uh, a Greek word that uh, at its root means to feel fatigue. And so the correlation is you get tired or feel fatigue when you work hard. And so it is a reference to those in a leadership position who work hard. And then he says, they are the ones who give you instruction. Who gives you instruction in the church? Well, in a sense, we all give each other instruction in the church, but there is the gift of teaching their is the formal presentation of teaching. James says, let not many of you be teachers, for theirs will be the severer or stricter judgment. So there is a a, a bit smaller group of individuals who are tasked with the responsibility to teach. And so they give instruction. It's a compound word there, uh, which is the word for mind and the word meaning to put. And the content or the idea of it is putting sense into the heads of people or the minds of people, giving instruction. It is a thankless but necessary task. And I encourage you to be aware of that. The uh, This would describe those who provide leadership in the church, in our church. That would include the the elders, the pastors. That would include the teaching leaders of the church, uh, those that work with the youth in teaching, those that work with the children in teaching, those that teach adult Sunday school, the women's ministry leaders and teachers there, as well as the men's ministry leaders and teachers. So we're told to recognize our leaders there in verse 12. Recognize them. And then in verse 13, we're to recognize them in three ways. Verse 13, he says, and that you regard them very highly in love live in peace with one another. First, we're to regard them very highly, literally to deem or consider them worthy of respect. Deem or consider them worthy of respect. That's regarding them highly. Second, we're to love them. We're to love them. When he says to regard them very highly, He says, in love, in love. Kids tend to hold the class bully in high regard, but not with love, you see. And these that provide teaching leadership in the church are anything but, or should be anything but, the class bully. And so we have an obligation to remember to love them as well as hold them in high regard. And then third, he says to be at peace with them. Now, now literally, the admonition is both to the, the followers and the leaders. Be at peace. 
just because a person accepts the mantle of church leadership does not give us the freedom to throw verbal stones at them. Rather, on both parts, on both parts, that of the the lead as well as the leader, our relationship should be characterized by peace, by peace. Romans 12, 18 says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. That is such an important verse, beloved, because so often we talk about fractured relationships that I don't get along with, but we don't admit to our part in it. So far as if possible, so far as it depends on you, what is your part in the fracture? Make sure you've dealt with that. You can't make the other person deal with theirs, but you must deal with yours. When we disregard our leaders, go behind their back, speak ill to others about them, gossip, we are facilitating the devil's fiery darts. Because you you understand there is a target on the back of every church leader, every person who makes a stand to represent the Lord Jesus as an under-shepherd, as a teaching leader to his flock. And so don't disregard them. But when we go to them with an attitude of respect and a heart of love and a commitment to peace, then we honor our mutual chief shepherd and we do not give our enemy the opportunity to take another shot at the target. Well, the second group of people about whom we are to, about whom we're given instruction should be is, is how to conduct ourselves with other believers. Now, he, he identifies a certain few of those other believers. And uh, he says in verse 14, we urge you, brothers and sisters, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. First, he says, admonish the unruly. Unruly can also be translated undisciplined. The NIV translates it as those who are idle. Uh, Take the initiative to correct those who are straying from the teaching of the word. And there's there's a lot of teaching of the word that talks about self-control and encouraging one another and so forth. Either their behavior, these unruly, is out of control, or they're just being lazy about their walk with God and about obeying the teaching of God. He's already admonished them to work hard for their food back in chapter 4, verse 11. So he says to warn them that there are consequences when we disobey God, when we live a life out of control. And so we need to encourage, teach, admonish. Then he says to encourage the faint-hearted. Timid also works here, probably refers to those who fear people, whose fear of people was overcoming their their boldness to share the love of Jesus, to stand up for Jesus. The English word to encourage means literally to give courage to another. It always blesses me when I'm about to go into a tough situation to know that someone else either has already been there or they're there with me now to give encouragement and to give strength and faithfulness. Remember that the source, according to 4.13, of our encouragement is the certainty of our hope. We can't lose even if they kill us. 
We need to keep perspective, and the perspective of eternity is incredibly important that we remember that these issues are settled. Therefore, we should allow God's perfect love to cast out the fear in our lives. Then he says to help the weak. Help the weak. Who who are these weak? Well, I would suggest that the weak would include those who would be easily victimized by the bully or by the, the unscrupulous. Certainly the widows and the fatherless, the widows and orphans, true religion, James says, is for those who care for the needs of the widows and the fatherless. Children easily victimized. Uh, in, in a way, this is a backhanded commandment for ch- children's ministry, that we minister to the needs of the little ones. But certainly with the marital breakups and the single parent homes, the, the children are, are in great need and, and weak. It would also include single moms, the infirm, shut-ins, the, the elderly. We need to care for those weak in our midst. And then he says to be patient with everyone. I guess the main thing I would want you to get from this, patience is not optional. So if God commanded you to be patient, you don't have the freedom to step away and say, oh, I'm just not a patient person. Guess what? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. God can give you patience if you let him, if you walk in the control and power of the Spirit. It's not normal, not natural within our human ability, but it is God's ability to be patient with others, just as God is patient with us. The third group of people he mentions here is how we should conduct ourselves with those who treat us unjustly. Dealing with injustice, verse 15, see that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek what is good for one another and for all people. What do you do when somebody wrongs you? How do you deal with injustice? Jesus talked about this. The New Testament talks about this much. The admonition here is, in a sense, kill them with kindness, with kindness. Romans 12, 19 says it this way, Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So if somebody wrongs you, don't pay them back in kind. Leave it to the Lord. It's not our responsibility to try to effect justice. Neither should you let the the desire for vengeance eat you up. And then he says, seek what is good for one another and for all people. This is pretty much self-explanatory. If you're seeking someone's good, it means you, you seek to meet their needs. If you're seeking for their good, you treat them with kindness, with compassion. Most certainly we are to do that for fellow believers but also the Holy Spirit includes here the term all people. Right after he said, don't repay evil for evil. And so we're to seek the good of all. Consider the current state in our country. What would happen if people began seeking the good of others? Philippians 2.4 commands us, do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. So, we're to recognize our leaders, 
We're to teach and encourage our sisters and brothers in Christ. And we're to seek what is good for all people, even those who treat us unfairly, unjustly. One of the greatest ways that you can respect your leaders in church, certainly apart from just simply obeying, doing what they tell you to do, one of the, one of the greatest ways to respect them is to pray for them, to pray for them. Leadership can be a lonely position, even in the church. And we have struggled mightily in, in 2020 in trying to do the right thing and, and effect the right thing. And we've seen division and we've seen threats of division. And we recognize the enemy's efforts to divide and conquer folks. Your leaders have been on their knees figuratively at least, to pray, 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 and to seek to work things out. Consider the conduct of your church family. Admonish the unruly, encourage the timid, help the weak, be be patient with everyone. Uh, Am I involved enough? We, We need to ask ourselves, am I involved enough in the church to even know who would be weak or unruly, and how I could step in to help. Your leaders can help you with that as well. If you have a heart to serve, they will help you and direct you. Understand the process of the Christian life begins and ends with Jesus. Jesus, only Jesus. And realize He sought no vengeance. He was the only truly innocent person to ever walk the face of the earth. And he was unjustly tried, condemned, and killed. Folks, we need to have the same attitude in ourselves that he had, that of humility, that of serving others. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you are so kind and gracious and so patient with us. All of us have have been unruly and undisciplined at various times. All of us have been weak and have struggled. And sadly, Father, all of us have spoken ill of those who are our leaders. And all of us, Father, have been tempted, if not given in to that temptation for vengeance, to repay evil for evil. Lord, we come to you grateful for this teaching, for your correction for us. And Lord, we admit that that apart from you, we can't do these things. In our own strength, we're not adequate. To, uh, to do all that you have directed us here to do. But, but Lord, we recognize that, uh, that as we allow Jesus to live his resurrected life through us, then, Lord, he's able to, to express his love and his patience and give his teaching and his words to those that are falling short and to to build up and encourage both the weak and the leaders, and Father, to to keep us from giving in to the temptation to repay evil for evil. I pray for your children this morning, this day, that we would receive your leadership in our lives, to speak to our hearts, to live, and to have the same attitude in ourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. And Father, I would also pray for those seekers, those coming to watch this message, this time of worship this this day, Lord, that have yet to take that step and put their faith in Jesus. I pray, Father, that you would do your part to draw them to Jesus. And Father, that they would awaken to the truth that you love them, 
and that you have in fact drawn them to Jesus. And it is for them now to open that door and receive Jesus, to believe in his name and trust in him. Father, we thank you for your grace, for your encouragement in Jesus' precious and powerful name, I pray. Amen. Benediction today is from the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen and God bless you.